All right. So last night's uh, class got, um, well, let's just say it was a good class, good conversation. I just forgot to hit record. So once again, that's on me. So we're going to hopefully redo this class, get a little better information, get the information out to you and get this post online today. So today we're talking about emergency vehicle operations. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, using aircraft too at the end of it. Um, but today we're going to talk mostly about um, emergency vehicle operations. So preparing for an ambulance call, receiving and responding to a call, transferring the patient to the ambulance, transporting the hospital or patient to the hospital, transferring the, host or the patient to the emergency department staff, terminating call, and then again, we're gonna end with air rescue. So we're gonna start out with uh, preparing for the ambulance call. So there's several types of ambulances out there. Uh, the ones we use mostly here in Commerce County are the type ones. These are on a pickup chassis, usually a 350, 450, or 550. Um, each one of them has its perks to it, as far as comfortability of ride, um, longevity and all that stuff uh personally i prefer the 350s they got a little more guts to them the 450s and the 550s are all governed out at pretty much interstate speeds so you're not going to get to a uh, call real quick with those not that that's important don't need to be doing 110 miles an hour to a call but sometimes you know five ten miles an hour over the speed limit is a good thing but we're going to get into these a little bit better. So uh, type one, again, we have most of our trucks this way. I believe we have one that's not a type one. Um, this is a type two. These are your van style ambulances. There are still a few of these around in the nation. I know that Denver, several of their hospitals run van style ambulances. They do have both two wheel and four wheel drive versions of these. So they can be used in almost any climate area. Uh, again, the, the only drawback of these is how much room you actually have in the back of these to work. Um, the ones that we had in the past, we did have a Mercedes Sprint style uh, van, similar to the one that's pictured. Uh, it was a good running vehicle. Just a lot of people were leery about running it just because of the high winds we have out here in Wyoming. Uh, the van style or the type three, these have the Econo or the E350 or 450 chassis on them. We do have one of these 229 is the style of an ambulance and very good ambulance. These also can be getting in, got, you can also find these in four wheel drive and two wheel drive. The one we currently have is a two wheel drive and is used mostly during the summertime. <laughs> Then you have your medium duty. Your medium duty and ambulances are usually on your commercial chassis, Freightliners, um, internationals, that style of chassis. When we first took over the Glen Rock Ambulance Service, they did have one that was made by Horton. Uh, the big problem with it is it had an air ride system that had a leak somewhere in it, and they had ran the lines through the frame, and so we couldn't get the line fixed. Overall, it was a good running truck, and the nice thing about it was you could be like 6263 and stand up in the back of it. Very nice chassis, very smooth running chassis. Again, what we find out with them is with their height, we do have some disadvantages actually getting into um, other hospitals' bays. So, and then you have your special purpose uh, or special response vehicles. These are your hazmat trucks. Um, New York, some of these have, these trucks are set up for rehab and mobile commands. So there's a lot of different styles to this. Casper's regional response, uh, especially uh, hazmat response vehicle is actually semi. Very good vehicles, uh, very expensive vehicles. So you don't see these a lot with rural units, but Usually your regional response teams will have something similar to this. All right, so the ambulance with proper equipment may have its 
agency without proper equipment, excuse me, without proper equipment may have its agency cited or fined a um, considerable amount of money by the state EMS regulatory. So when we put an ambulance in service, the state has a specific loadout plan for that ambulance, depending on whether it's BLS or ALS. And in order for it to be licensed as an ambulance in the state of Wyoming, it has to have all this equipment on it. Um, I think on page, I'll get to the right page here. Um, 11.45 through 11.48, I believe, as a loadout plan in your book kind of shows what most ambulances are required to carry on them. And this is just a good idea to let you know what is on the ambulance. But it is still your responsibility as the EMT, paramedic, AMT, whatever you have it, whatever your certification level is, that when you get into an ambulance, you should know where each item is, what it's used for, and when it should be used. So this is your responsibility. If you have a good FTO, they will spend a couple days showing you the ambulance and making sure you know where everything is. There we go. All right. So ensuring for ambulance readiness, uh, again, you want to do your morning checks, make sure everything is where it needs to be, you have the right amount of equipment, you have the proper dates on them. So it's very easy. If you're not in an ambulance for a while, like we have four ambulances here in Douglas, two of them are used on a daily basis. And then we switch out during the summertime to get those other ambulances used. But when we switch out, you need to make sure that you're going through those ambulances, making sure nothing's expired, make sure the drugs are good and all that to make sure you're properly prepared to go out on a call. Um, inspect vehicle equipment, start of every shift. And then you wanna do, make sure you do a good handoff report with your ongoing and off-going crews. That way everybody's up to speed is what happened on the shift previous. Are there any new developments? Has the hospital come down with any new guidance on how we should be operating? So you want to make sure everybody's up to date and kind of current on that. So there's two components to checking uh, ambulance. Uh, book has it broken down as driver completes one, crew leader com uh, completes the other. Since we don't really have designated drivers here, in our service, um, it's really up to you as a crew to go through your truck. Since we have four trucks, only one crew is on at a time with one crew on standby, it's important that you check all the trucks to make sure they're ready to go. Now, the crew that worked before you on their truck should have had it restocked and everything like that. But it's just courteous to go through their truck, make sure they didn't miss anything again. Two eyes are good, four eyes are better, eight eyes are, are um, preferred. So if you can get a couple people checking rigs every day, you make sure that truck is complete and ready to go when it leaves the, the hall. Making sure you check the body, doing good outside sweep of the vehicle is very important. You want to make sure your tires are properly inflated, no new dents or scratches on it. Um, make sure your lug nuts are tight. Make sure your mirrors and your windshields are clean so that you can see when you're backing up. If you do have a backup camera, go ahead and make sure it's clean so that you can see out of it. And check your windshield wiper blades to make sure there's no chunks or, or anything wrong with it that's going to interfere if you have to use them. Uh, check the interior service, upholstery, make sure there's no rips. Again, this is a good time. You should be starting at least the beginning of your matrix, doing a good clean on your ambulance before you take it out, uh, spraying down the seat, spraying down the cot, mopping the floor, making it swept out, um, and making sure your vehicle is clean before you go out. Uh, nothing's more embarrassing than putting a, a patient into a dirty rig, so you want to make sure you're providing your patients with the best care possible. 
Um, again, when the engine shut off, we were inspecting uh, the body of the vehicle for any damage. Anything that's new, you want to make sure it gets reported, whether you did it or someone else did it. The one thing is accidents happen. Um, even though there's no such thing as an accident, you know, people make mistakes. And, you know, you back into pylons, back into garage doors, uh, stuff gets damaged. Make sure you record it. That way, people know that it needs to be fixed. And inspect the wheels and the tires for damage, wear, make sure they're got the tight, proper pressure in them, make sure the tread depth is good. Uh, make sure you're checking these things because the last thing you need is a blowout when you're on the interstate with a patient on board. Inspect mirrors and windows. Again, look for broken glass, loose parts, missing parts, and make sure they're clean. Uh, make sure every door opens. Um, again, we talked about this last night in class, but you know, there's times we take these things to these vehicles to get the oil changed or something like that. We lock the outside doors. Um, and then when you get on a call, you've forgotten to unlock all the doors. You go to get equipment out and the door is locked. So you want to make sure all the doors and everything's working before you go out on your first call. Uh, check fluid levels. Um, make sure you're, you got proper amount of oil. Remember when you're checking the transmission fluid, run the vehicle for five, 10 minutes, make sure it's warmed up, and then check it. Um, check the batteries, make sure the connections are good. If you see corrosion, go ahead and get it cleaned off or let somebody know that knows how to do that. Inspect the interior surfaces, upholstery for damage, cleanness, wipe it down. Uh, wipe down your steering wheel. Um, most of us are pretty good, I think, about if we've had patient contact of taking our gloves off and swapping them out before we get behind the wheel. But think about what you're putting on that wheel every time you get into it. So make sure you wipe down the steering wheel, disinfect it, disinfect the inside. Make sure your truck's clean and ready to go. Check the windows for operation. Side windows should go up and down um, with no problems. So make sure that's good. And then finally, test your horn and siren and emergency lights. Um, with our vehicles, we usually have them tied into where the horn operates the siren. You can check both of them by just flipping a switch on the panel and then making sure both work. And do a good walk around, make sure all your lights are working, and then do test your siren. Uh, adjust the driver's seat, make sure the seat belts are operational. I do work with some vertically challenged people in, in the on the service. So if I try to get into a vehicle after, say, one of my partners has been in it, I'm probably going to hit my knees on the steering wheel. Vice versa, if they get in after I've been driving, they can't even reach the pedals. So make sure you do the adjustments before you get going. Make sure you're ready to go. And then fuel levels. Um, my kind of rule of thumb is once it drops below three quarters of a tank, I'm probably going to fill it up before the end of my shift. Um, at a three quarters or above, I know I can make it anywhere in the county and be okay. But once you get down below that, if you have an emergency transport, say Cheyenne, which is 123, 24 miles away to the hospital there, you're looking at a vehicle that gets seven miles to a gallon. You're probably going to need to refuel at some point. So make sure you're topped off before you do those long transfers. Um, Denver is 235 miles away. So again, you're looking at different distances that you're probably gonna need to fuel up if you're, if you're running on a lower tank. So make sure you refuel before you take those big long transports. Check under the hood, make sure you're always checking for loose belts, uh, loose oil cap, Loose anything. So make sure nothing's out of place. Nothing's been left in there by the mechanics. We have on occasion gotten these back from shops and there's wrenches and stuff on the engine cowl. So you want to make sure you, you check those on a daily basis. 
All right, so check dash mounted indicators. You're going to make sure your turn signals work. You got all your warning lights that come on. You want to make sure your voltage is up there to where it sh should be reading either 14 to 24 volts. Um, check your dash mount gauges for proper operation. Uh, you want to make sure you depress your brake pedal. Make sure there's not a lot of travel in it. You also want to make sure your brake lights are working, so check that. Currently, we don't have any on our service that have air, air uh, brakes, but if you do have air brakes on your service, make sure you're checking those. Make sure it's holding above that 70 uh, PSI. And then test your parking brake. Very simple thing. Put your parking brake on, put it in drive, see if it'll move or won't move your parking brake's working. Um, if it is uh, having issues, then you do want to make sure that you get it turned in. Uh, make sure your maintenance person knows so that they can get it in and get it worked on. And then always remember once you're done, put it back in park before you turn it off. Okay? Or before you take the parking brake off. Make sure you're turning, your steering wheel will turn side to side. There's not a lot of play in it. Again, check operation for windshield wipers, washer fluid. Uh, make sure you're cleaning your your, uh, your windshield. And it's not a bad idea that so once a matrix, twice a matrix, lift your windshield wipers up, take a little bit of window cleaner on it, and run it down the, the blade of the wipers to make sure they're cleaned off. That way you get that nice, even um, cleaning action whenever they operate. Uh, turn on their warning lights. Either you or your partner do a walk around, make sure everything's uh, working right. And then always remember to turn them off when you're done. Make sure your headlights work, turn signals, brake lights, rear lights, all that stuff works. For our trucks, we have the scene lights on the side, left, right, and rear. Make sure all those, all those work. Um, make sure your onboard suction works. Anything that is hooked up to your vehicle, make sure it's operating properly. Uh, make sure your communication system's on. Uh, we used to do be pretty good about doing radio checks here. We've kind of gotten away from that. That's not a bad idea that if you're new to the service, just do a radio check to make sure you're able to communicate with your dispatch. And then cell phone communications. Some services have a dedicated cell phone on their truck. Uh, we used to do that, but half the time it was dead or we didn't have service with it. So a lot of us use our own personal cell phones, understand the, the, how they operate, where your dead spots are, and be aware when you're communicating with cell phone that we do have a lot of dead space here in Wyoming that you'll drop your cell service, kind of know where it is if, if you're familiar with the area. And again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you have a backup camera, make sure it's not damaged and that it's cleaned off so that you can see and use it. These things are very helpful, uh, but they don't replace having a spotter. So if you have questions about it, have your partner get out or have fire department law enforcement uh, back you up. And then make sure your backup alarm is operating. I know uh, most of ours just have an intermittent switch that turns it off. But once you start it back up, it comes back on. One truck, I believe up in Glen Rock, does have one that turns off. off. And it's kind of nice, but at the same time, you don't remember to turn that on, you start backing up. Nobody has a warning that you're backing up. Uh, using your checklist, we do have a daily checklist inspection sheet that we go through or are supposed to go through. Uh, make sure you're using that when you're checking your truck. Um, make sure you mark any deficiencies. And then if there's any equipment missing, make sure you're replacing it. Uh, test your oxygen and ventilation equipment proper operations. So we do have three small tanks and one large tank on all our trucks. Make sure they are above the 500. We do replace all ours once they hit 500. So make sure they're at the proper PSI. 
If you're going on long transport and you're close to that 500, make sure you switch that tank out before you do the transport. Uh, we don't carry any rescue tools on our particular trucks, but if you do have a service that you do that, make sure you are checking them. Any battery operated equipment, such as portable suctions, Lucas, um, vents, anything like that, that may use uh, battery power, make sure they're fully charged. Uh, make sure you are unplugging them after a while and not just leaving them plugged in all the time because you will eventually kill the battery. And then when you go to unplug it and use it, it's not going to work. Uh, we've had to replace several batteries on our suction units this year just for that reason. So make sure you're looking into that. Some equipment such as AED may uh, require additional testing. So look, make sure the indicator on it is not red. Um, if it is, make sure it's taken out of service and we get a battery order for it or some, some kind of changes made to it. Also check your pads in, in the ADs and on the monitors. These are things that, at least for us here in the rural setting, we do run codes, but they're far and few between. They're not an everyday thing, so those pads don't always get check, checked or replaced as often as they should. So make sure you're checking them. Make sure you're not um, running with expired pads. Make sure you're correcting any deficiencies or missing items. And if it's something that you can't fix or it needs to be uh, addressed by someone else, make sure you let the supervisor know um, or the maintenance person know so that that can get fixed. One thing we're really good about here is if we see something that needs to be fixed, if we can fix it, we fix it. And it usually gets a lot replaced and fixed a lot quicker if we do it and can do it safely than if we report it up the chain of command. So make sure you're, you know what you're doing, replace what you can, fix what you can. If you can't fix it, let someone else know. And then finally, clean the unit for infectious control appearance. My pet peeve is people that don't wash the trucks, man. I am big on um, washing the trucks. I worked for the sheriff's office for eight years. And every time I came to work with a dirty truck, my under sheriff would say, I don't care what your truck looks like at the end of your shift, but at the beginning of the shift, it will be clean. So we washed our trucks every day, uh, made sure they were clean. And when we started our shift, they were nice, shiny vehicles. I th believe that's the same way when we were with the county as an ambulance service. And uh, we went on a call. Every time we came back from a call, the trucks were washed. Um, didn't matter what the temperature is. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I've taken ambulances out in negative degree weather. And I've never had an issue with the doors freezing up because I washed the vehicle. I've had them frozen when I got there because I had an inch of ice on the back of the truck, but that had nothing to do with the fact that I washed the vehicle. That was the fact that there was a lot of snow and it was nasty conditions outside. So, and, but even with that, we were always able to get the doors open after breaking the ice off. So um, don't be afraid of washing your vehicles and keeping them clean. Uh, and then make sure your inside area is clean. And with the cots, you sometimes have to really do a lot of good inspection on your cots because of the fact that stuff gets down in there that uh, you may not see. So anytime you have something that's nasty, make sure you're pulling the, the pad off, getting both sides of the pad, make sure you're, you're spraying the cot down if you need to. Uh, doing a good scrub on it, making sure there's no areas that are being missed and hiding the little nasty stuff. All right. So as I, when we do our think about thing this time, it's as I walk around the vehicle, engine on, engine off, check. What information do I get from what I hear, see, or smell? So hearing, you might hear a ping in the engine, um, something that doesn't sound right, so make sure you're reporting that. Uh, C, dents, broken headlights, uh, equipment that's not working. Smell, 
All our trucks are diesel, so they should be smelling like they're going through an exhaust um, filter. If there's a smell that's not normal to you or it just smells nasty or it's blowing out black smoke or white smoke, make sure you report it because those are signs that there could be something wrong with the engine. All right, so receiving and responding to a call. We have uh, dispatch that dispatches for us is dispatches both law enforcement fire, well, dispatches law enforcement fire and, and EMS. Um, be aware that they may be busy, so if they don't respond to you right away, be patient with them. Keep track of your own times if necessary. Um, so what is their, their role? Their role is to ask questions of the caller and assign priority to the calls. We really don't have high level calls here. We run about 250 a month, which for you know larger cities, that's maybe a daily rate. But for us, there, there isn't very often that they're prioritizing the call. There are times that two calls drop at the same time. They usually ask the primary unit what they wanna do at that point, we'll assign the call priority. We'll take the, the most uh, important call or the, the higher priority call and let secondary take the lower priority call or Glen Rock or whoever's running second out that day. Um, they also pre, uh, provide pre-arrival pre medical instructions. So these people will have a book in front of them Person says they're having chest pain, they'll flip to the chest pain, start asking them questions, ruling things out and giving them instructions on how to take care of it. If the person's in cardiac arrest, they can give instructions on how to do CPR over the phone and um, can start helping with getting some of the care taken care of prior to our arrival. They also dispatch and coordinate EMS resources. So we have uh, like, five or seven categories that are automatically fires paged out with us. So we have extra hands on scene. Um, other calls such as suicide, um, gunshot wounds, domestic violence calls, law enforcement's automatically sent to them. Uh, law enforcement's listening to the radio. Sometimes they respond on other calls just so that they can help us out. Uh, we do have a very good working relationship with all our um, emergency services here in Converse County. Very proud of that, and we are very protective of it, too. Um, and then they coordinate with other public safety agencies, Highway Patrol, Life Flight. Um, if it's a mutual aid where we're going into another county, they'll, they'll coordinate with them. So that makes our trip and our exposure uh, very good. So. so questions that an EMD should ask is the exact location of the patient, what the callback number, what the problem is, how old the patient is, what's patient's sex, what's their conscious, or is they, is they conscious? Are they conscious and are they breathing? So those are the questions they're gonna be asking. They're also going to ask the number of patients that we have. So are we going to just one person or are we going to multiple people? So do we need a, a second unit sent out? So now we're getting into more the safety aspects of it. So be a safe ambulance op operator. You should be physically and mentally fit. This job is very taxing. taxing on your mental status and physically. So you wanna make sure you're doing something to keep yourself in that fitness level. Either doing exercise, doing yoga, seeing therapy if you need it. There's a lot of things out there that you wanna do to make sure you maintain that physical and mental fitness. Now be able to perform under stress. Our job is very stressful at times. So you wanna make sure you can perform calmly and rationally under high stress situations and not amplify the situation by not being in control of yourself. Um, have a positive attitude about your ability. 
as a driver and as a clinician. Um, don't be an unreasonable risk taker. Uh, we'll get into it a little bit later when we talk about lights and sirens, but for probably 80 to 90% of our calls, lights and sirens are not needed. And so to run lights and sirens when it's not necessary is just asking for troubles down the road. So be aware of your abilities and don't drive above your limitations. Also be tolerant of other drivers. This is something we talked about last night you know, a little more in depth, but for everything a driver does to you that makes you upset or gets you thinking about swearing at them or giving them the bird or doing something that is aggressive or road rage, type uh, response, understand you've done the exact same thing to somebody else. We've all ran a stop sign or two. We've all pulled out in front of somebody. We've all cut in a little bit too close to somebody. So make sure you're not taking aggression out for someone on someone who, who's doing something that you've done to someone else. Um, it kind of goes back to the biblical principle of take the plank out of your own eye before you try and take the speck out of somebody else's eye. Understand that you've made the same mistakes. Be tolerant and just let it go. And then never drive under the influence of any substance. If you're a drinker, um, we pretty much, I believe in our policy is you can't have, for the hospital anyways, is no alcohol within eight hours of your shift. I'd have to look that up just to make sure, but um, on the fire department, um, if you've had one drink, you can't respond to a call for an hour after you've had that one drink and you can't drive a vehicle if you've had a drink in the last eight hours. That's in our policies. Uh, that's something that we hold to. So you want to make sure you're, you're careful about that. All right. Never drive while taking prescription medications that can impair your ability to operate a motor vehicle. So if it says don't operate heavy equipment. While on this, you probably either should not be working that day if you have to take it or not be driving. And never drive on a suspended license. That's pretty self-explanatory. Always wear your glasses and contact lenses if required for driving. Can't see the road. You're not doing anybody any good. So make sure you're wearing your proper uh, glasses or contact lenses. Evaluate your ability to drive based on personal stress, illness, and fatigue. If you're tired, if you've been on a 24-hour shift and been running that whole 24 hours, probably shouldn't be driving. Probably shouldn't be really taking care of the patient either. So make sure that you're well-rested, best you can be. Um, I know in the past we've, we've gotten patients flown down to Denver because they wanted to fly us or wanted us to ground pound a patient to Denver. And me and my partner had been up for 24 hours, basically running calls. And we said, no, we can't do it. So um, we've, we've gotten other ways of getting the patient to where they needed to go. But we also knew our limitations and refused on the point of safety. Understanding the law. So you must have a valid operator's license to um, complete a, a training program. Um, driving is a privilege. It's not a right. So under the law, the operators of ambulances apply, apply when driving, when the vehicle is responding to an emergency. Uh, excuse me. That's not what that says. So privilege is granted under law to the operators of ambulances. Apply when the vehicle is responding to an emergency. They are not applicable all the time. You can't run around with lights and sirens unless it's an emergent call. Not every call that comes into us is an emergency. You're gonna base it on what the call information is 
and what how that falls into the priority of calls. So we do have some things that we can do, like going over the speed limit, parking long, wrong direction on the road, even going into oncoming traffic. But you have to do that in a way that protects life and property of other people. There's very uh, stringent wording in Wyoming law that says do regard for the safety of others. If you are driving outside that due regard for the safety of others, there is no immunity for you. You will get arrested. You can be sued. You can face criminal charges. So you want to be careful with that. And then it also only applies if you're using the proper warning devices in a manner prescribed by law. Wyoming law says if you're operating lights, you're operating sirens. So you should be operating in that manner. Now, as courtesy and Douglas, when we're going through the city, we don't necessarily run sirens. We'll run lights, but we also slow down a little bit more than what we normally would be doing on an emergent call. We make sure we're stopping at all intersections and we're driving with due regard for the safety of others. So make sure you understand that. Um, also, um, when we're running outside of town, a lot of times we turn our sirens off just because we don't want to have headaches when we get to the call, especially if it's 30, 40 miles out. Um, one of the things, especially on dirt roads, you want to make sure is if you can't see around the corner or you can't see over the top of the hill, you turn your sirens on prior to entering that area. So before you get into the curve, you're turning your sirens on. Before you crest the hill, you're turning your sirens on. And hopefully that's giving warning enough to the person on the other side that, hey, someone's coming this way. Understand the law. Most uh, statutes allow for parking wherever necessary, as long as life and property are not endangered. Uh, proceeding past stop signs and signals, exceeding the posted speed limit, as long as life and property are not endangered. So as far as stop signs and uh, red lights go, you want to make sure that you're slowing down so that you can stop if someone doesn't give you the right of way. Um, most time, uh, even on green lights, I will slow down to the speed limit or below as I approach a uh, green light because I don't know if the person approaching that has the red light is paying more attention to my sirens than they are the fact they have a red light. So make sure you're driving safely. Again, don't put yourself at risk. Don't put your partners at risk. Um, in most cases of ambulance accidents, the driver may be injured, but they're not killed. The person that's killed is their partner in the back. There's a lot of things that fly around in the back of an ambulance. So We'll get into that a little bit later about making sure everything's secure, but you really want to watch yourself, make sure as the driver you're driving safely and keeping everybody intact. So passing, no passing zones. Again, that comes into uh, being careful is no passing zones are usually there for a reason. So if you're coming up on top of the hill and the person can't get over, it's best to stay behind them until you've crested the hill and can make sure no vehicles are coming before you go around them in no passing zone. Um, direction of travel. Again, we don't like where we live. We have two roads that are one way. They're the same street. They're just divided by a little median there. Um, we can go the wrong way on the one way, but make sure you're using caution. Uh, siren, uh, never use it indiscriminately. That's uh, one of the things we talked about. You know, we have some people that every call they run lights and sirens. Well, that gets people complacent and hearing sirens all the time. Um, they might not be paying attention to you as much as they should be. Um, really, the only time I use lights and sirens is if it's chest pain, cardiac arrest, gunshot, stroke. 
Um, difficulty breathing um, depends on what the call is. And then anything that's serious on children. I don't run lights and sirens all that often. Um, and it's just, I mean, that's the way I do it. But if you run lights and sirens on every call, you're probably increasing your risk for, well, you are increasing your risk for getting in an accident and causing issues down the road. So don't use them unless you have to. Um, morning devices, day and night. Uh, all the lights should be visible 360 around the vehicle. You should have them on the side of your truck, front of your truck, but rear of your truck. You should be able to walk around that thing and see some kind of warning device all the way around it. As far as the horn goes, if you have an air horn, um, you don't need to be laying on that thing all the time. Um, usually a couple of blasts before you come up on an intersection just to break up the monotony of the siren. And changing your siren tones also as you come up to intersection helps get people's attention. So um, just use them, again, use them sparingly. Speed and safety, anytime you're speeding, it increases the probability of collision. So uh, make sure you're paying attention to this, make sure you're watching out, looking ahead, checking out people who are coming up to stop signs or, or coming to intersections that you're gonna be crossing. The majority of crashes for ambulances happen at intersections. And so you need to be aware of that. You need to be checking the intersections you need to be using due regard. On top of that, speed increases stopping distances. You got to remember where we may be in a 550, a 450, or a 350 truck, but we also have a lot more weight on that truck than you might have in yours. So make sure you're paying attention to that. Increase your following distance. Check, make sure you're not getting too close to people, that you have time to stop if they stop, or you have time to stop if someone decides not to give you the right of way. Escorts. Escorts are one of my, one of the things that I do not like using. Um, we, sometimes law enforcement makes that call for us and we're not able to slow them down or stop them before, you know, this happens. But um, usually when you have an escort, that increases your chances of getting in an accident. People pay attention to the first emergency vehicle they see, and they usually don't see the second. Um, in this case, we will always operate on a different siren tone than what the vehicle escort in this will. Um, that way, there's always two tones that they're hearing. So first tone past them, they're checking for that second tone. Um, recommendation by national standard and just about everywhere is no escorts unless absolutely needed. And for the most part, an escort's gonna save you maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Um, some cases that might be important, other cases it's not. In a town like ours using lights and sirens even going across town, is going to save you about 30 seconds. So it's about two miles from the hospital to uh, Safeway. Going to that, again, it's going to save me maybe 30 seconds getting there. So is that really going to make an effort or a big difference in the treatment of that patient? Probably not. So make sure you're, you're using your head. Um, don't drive recklessly and just be aware of what's going on around you. Okay, factors that affect response, day of the week. So in Douglas, Wyoming, town of about 6,000, we're looking at our busiest times of the day are right around eight, between 7.30 and 8.30 when you have school in session. Um, and around, I think it's around 4.45 to 3.30 when school's getting out. That's when all the kids are leaving and going to school. So we have a little bit of um, traffic congestion then. Um, 
it's not like the big cities where you have rush hours and stuff like that, but it still can get frustrating when you got a lot of traffic out on the road. So make sure you're paying attention, um, especially during the weekdays, time of day. We just went over that mornings, afternoons, get a little more congestion, you know, around 5.30 to 7 o'clock, you have the miners coming back from work. So it does get a little congested then too. So be aware of that. Weather. Uh, we live in Wyoming, so the weather's always a factor. I've seen it snow in July here. So snow is always a possibility. Rain, um, high winds, all that kind of counter into how safe you're going to be able to drive. Uh, road maintenance and construction, you turn off your lights and sirens, you do the speed limit through um, road maintenance and construction areas. That is what the state says you're going to do, so make sure you do it. Uh, railroads, you are not going to beat a train, so don't try it. If you have to go another way because of the railroad or a rail crossing, make sure you're um, paying attention. And it's not going to slow time down to go a different direction when you could just wait a couple more seconds for the train to get by. Also, be careful that we do have a lot of um, marked but no gated, non gated um, railroad crossings. If they don't have a gate on them, they usually do have the warning lights. So if the warning lights are going, stop for it. Don't try to beat it. Um, just be patient. Bridges and tunnels. For the most part, our vehicles will pass under any bridge or tunnel in the state. Um, but again, when you're looking at those medium duties or those uh, specialty, special response vehicles, those are a little bit taller. So you do have to be cognizant of what the height of railroad bridges, uh, regular bridges, tunnels are. I know that we have one railroad bridge here in, in Douglas where uh, most of our fire apparatuses will fit underneath it, but our ladder trucks won't. So you need to be careful on that. School buses and school zones, um, you will stop for them. You will slow down to the speed limit, turn your lights and sirens off, and go the speed limit through those zones. Uh, that's the law. Uh, school buses, if they have their stop sign out, you have to stop for them. And be aware of that. Uh, navigation to the scene. The uh, best way is knowing your area. With GPS and all that going on now, a lot of times you can pull it up on your phone and you can use that to find where you're going. Uh, the CAD system, when it's working, will have a map system on it. Just be aware of that. Um, GPS and maps may have a delay, so you may actually pass by the place before it actually says you're at it. Just be aware of that. Um, don't let it become a distraction, you know. Um, always obtain detailed maps of your service area if you don't know it, and that way you can take a look at it. Know the one thing you can study it when you're not on calls, but if you do have a call, you can have your partner looking at the map and telling you, giving you good directions to where you're going. All right, so again, minimize lights and sirens on hot responses. Um, wear your seat belts. Uh, know where you're going before you respond. So it's always good to, if you don't know where you're going, look it up in GPS, check your maps, look it up on the CAD. Um, be aware of new construction, too. Like right now, uh, with the boom we had a couple of years ago, there's a lot of new constructed areas that are not on maps. They're not on GPSs. They're just new roads that you may have to ask dispatch if you can't find it on your map or your GPS. All right. So safety at highway incidents. Uh, keep unnecessary units and people off the highway. Um, we just had a couple, uh, uh, one medic and get killed and another one seriously injured down in Rollins out on the roadways where a truck hit them. Um, 
again, that was icy road conditions, um, bad conditions, be aware of your surroundings and try and make sure you're parked as far off the highway as you can. Avoid crossovers unless the turn can be completed without obstructing traffic. Um, understand that people are, at least here in Wyoming, uh, speed limits 80 miles an hour and usually people are driving a little bit over that. So make sure you can make that turn safely if you have to do a turnaround. Um, if not, if you don't think you can do it safely or if the turnaround's um, blocked with snow, go up to the next exit, make your turn there. And then protect the scene. If you're the first unit on scene, the best you can. Um, the highway patrol guys that come in and do vehicle reconstruction or accident reconstruction are very good about eliminating your tracks, but don't be the first one on the scene, drive over the tracks, then have fire drive over the tracks and make their job any harder than what you have to do. But uh, protect yourself and then protect the scene if you can. Make sure you're wearing your PPE. Um, when you're out on the roadways, that PPE should include a reflective vest. Um, according to OSHA, it's a requirement. Uh, same with National Highway Safety and Traffic Administration. Um, if you can, place cones and flares out to help guide people around you. Um, if you're the first unit on scene, place your unit so that it's protecting the crash site or the injury so that hopefully they don't cause worse injuries by hitting the crash and hit something else first. That's why a lot of times you'll see fire departments coming up um, and doing blocking with engines so that the engine will get hit and not the workers on the scene. I believe there's a pretty good picture in your book on that. Let's see what page that's on. Probably not gonna be able to find it here. All right, on page uh, 1159, they got a diagram there on how you should kind of set up your scene to help uh, block off and protect your work area. Um, cones, flares, <clears throat> again, be cognizant of what you're using. Uh, we do use a lot of cones. We do have the little strobe light flares but try to avoid using uh, the ignition flares just because of the chance that, especially if there's gasoline around or fumes around, you don't want to be um, introducing a heat source to a potential volatile situation. And then backing up, avoid backing up if possible, especially during emergencies. Uh, if you do have to back up, make sure you have a ground guide, either fire, law enforcement, someone to, to back you up so that you're not running into anybody, running anybody over. All right, so transferring the patient to the ambulance. You wanna make sure you're selecting the proper patient carry device. So for us, there's um, several different devices that we use. There's some that some people like more than others. For me personally, I use a scoop stretcher for just about anything that I think um, I need to move the patient, but I don't want to like actually pick them up manually. Um, scoop stretcher works really good. Some people hate it. Some people prefer backboards. That's fine. Just understand that uh, the longer the patient's on the backboard or scoop, the more they have a chance of developing pressure ulcers and stuff like that. So once you do get them moved onto the cot, if it's safe to do so, go ahead and take them off whatever transfer device you use. Um, stair chair, we use that a lot. And uh, especially with the newer stair chairs out there, it's amazing to work with them. When you're packaging you a patient for transfer, make sure you are properly securing them, keeping them covered up, protect their modesty, 
you have to remove clothing to look at an injury, make sure you're covering them up with a blanket, remove it, then remove the clothing, um, move the patient to the ambulance, uh, load the patient into the ambulance, do it safely. Uh, let's see what, all right. So when you are removing them, uh, this is kind of an older picture. I don't think a lot of services still use these cots, but with us, we have the power load cots and uh, power stretchers. Uh, so when you're using that, uh, going over rough terrain, you still want to make sure you have four points of contact. You want to make sure you have four people on that cot to make sure it's stabilized as you're going over rough terrain. When you're loading it, it's best to have two people in the back, just kind of keep it stabilized. If you have to manually load it, you definitely want two people on the back, one on each side, uh, lift it up and to be able to push it in smoothly. Um, when I first started, we were, I guess first got my EMT certification back in 2000, we still had some of the cots that you had to lower all the way to the ground and then pick them up. If you're doing that, you want to make sure you have four people on it, keep it stabilized, and do it properly. All right. Again, make sure you have all proper carrying devices. Make sure they're strapped down. Don't be moving people and, and doing stuff without them being secured to whatever you're moving them with. Okay, and then, so before you get them too packaged up, make sure you got any impelled objects stabilized, any wounds that need to be cared for that are gonna be um, hindered by them being placed on the cot, uh, make sure you get those taken care of, and then check dressings and splints. Again, just like when you're putting the splint on, you check pulses before and after splinting, Anytime you move a patient, make sure you're checking the pulses again. And then cover the patient and secure uh, the patient to the covering, uh, carrying device. The reason we cover them up beforehand and then secure them is so that you see the seatbelts. It's pretty common they get into a hospital, people will get in a hurry, they'll try and move them over and not all the seatbelts are released. So make sure that you're securing the patients over whatever you're covering them up with. And again, must be, I think we've kind of covered this all already. Make sure they're, they're uh, secured. Make sure you're using all your straps, chest, waist, and lower extremities. Um, shoulders harness, if available, should be used. Uh, we pretty good about that sometimes though, they get forgotten. So uh, make sure you are using all your straps. Shoulder strap is uh, very important, especially if you're looking at, say, a backboarded patient, because that backboard is basically plastic on top of plastic, and that slides very easy. So if you don't have them properly secured, driver stops real quick or gets an uh, accident, that causes sudden jolt forward, that patient's gonna end up with the driver. So make sure you do have them properly secured. So if an EMT is gonna die, they're gonna die in the patient compartment. There are a lot of projectiles back there. You wanna make sure your, your monitor, any O2 cylinders, um, warmers, anything that might be in the back of that truck should be secured down in some fashion. Um, best way of doing this is just making sure all your equipment's where it needs to be. Uh, we try the best we can to keep benches clean and uh, counters clean. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. So make sure you're securing anything that might fly around and be a hazard. Wear your seatbelt and harness if possible. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're moving around a lot. If you got a really serious patient, you're constantly moving. But if you can be secured, be secured. And then once you're in your transport, 
And during your response, make sure you're not moving around unnecessarily. All right, as you're going to the um, hospital, you're going to continue your uh, assessment, secure the stretcher in place in the ambulance, uh, position, secure the patient. Make sure, like, especially with these auto load um, stretchers that we have now, that you hear that click when the, when the stretcher lowers down into its locking device. Um, if you don't and you're using the old manual lift stretchers, make sure that securing device on the side of the cot is locked in before you get going. Um, if you feel those things moving around the back of the truck, that's a bad day. Make sure all the straps are adjusted properly and make sure that you're always prepared for respiratory and cardiac complications. Um, I've seen some straps that are secured to the frame of the, of the cot, and that goes with shoulder straps. All of a sudden, you need to sit the patient up for some reason, and you can't because they're secured to the frame instead of to the actual bed of the cot. So make sure your, your straps are properly secured. Make sure you loosen any constrictive clothing. If a relative or friends must accompany a patient, they sit up front with the driver. Uh, the only time we deviate from that really is uh, with children, and they're they're off. You know, we can, we still need to ask parents some information. In that case, they're sat in the captain's the rear facing seat and they are secured and seat belted in the whole time. That way we still have the sides to work around and we can still do patient care. If you take personal effects, make sure they're in a secure bag, make sure you know where they're at. And then most importantly, leave them with the patient. And always talk to your patient. Your patient, even if they're unconscious, make sure you're talking to them, telling them what's going on, giving them reassurances, and helping them to understand that you're doing your best and that you're going to be taking good care of them. Uh, and avoid letting patients sit on the bench or the airway seat. Again, this is gonna come down to a uh, safety reason. Um, there's certain times where if you have a psych patient, someone who is, um, it's not necessary for them to be on the cot for you to treat them. Um, as much as you can try to get them on the cot, but I have had um, psych patients that I've, uh, the only way they'll go in is if they're sitting. And so if they do uh, insist on doing that, then again, the rear facing seat is the most safe position for them to be in. And you can also position yourself on the bench seat with the cot in between you, protect yourself. So if you have to do that, then you know, use, your, use your resources you have available. All right, in route, notify the, uh, notify the receiving hospital, um, continue to provide emergency care as required. Use safe practices during transport. We've kind of covered some of this already. Uh, make sure you're getting any information that you don't already have from the patient. So this is a good time to do your uh, sample history. If you haven't already done it, this is a good time to begin a second set of vitals or another set of vitals. And then you want to notify the receiving facility. They, I think it's funny they have that first and last of what you're finding any changes um, and an ETA as to when you're getting in. So pediatric note, uh, if you can um, reduce the fear that the child is having by using a teddy bear, uh, bringing their favorite toy with them, um, having a female 
EMT in the back or an officer may be helpful because let's face it, EMTs are not necessarily the glory people of emergency services. So if you can have a firefighter or a police officer ride back there with you, the kid may be a little more relaxed with them than they are with you. Also, females have a tendency of having a little calmer effect on children than males do. Again, that's not always the case, but you know, use your use your um, resources you have and to help calm them down. Now, with that being said, there's been a lot of changes over the last since I started. We used to get donations of um, used stuffed animals all the time. We'd take them down to the dry cleaner, have them dry cleaned, and that has pretty much gone out of the experience now. So anymore, they have to be new wrapped stuffed animals. So we got a bunch of stuff from the mines a few years back. And what we did was we just took gallon bags, took the brand new toys that we got from the mines, put them in a bag that keeps them clean, that keeps them from getting infected in the vehicle. And uh, we use them that way. Uh, again, do what your local protocols tell you you can do. And... Um, do what the best you can for the children. And then uh, this kind of a weird footnote in here, small children do not as a rule carry identification. So most of them don't. So in that case you do, you may need to have your parent riding in the back with you so that you can get the information you need for these patients. All right. So we're getting down to the end of this now. Uh, so transferring the patient to the emergency department staff um, in routine situations or when the illness or injury is not life-threatening, um, you may want to check to see what they want done with the patient. So we work for a small hospital. We have a five-bed ER. There have been times where we've brought patients in and there's no place to put the patient. So they end up waiting on our cot. This is something that you can have the doctor or the nurse look at them, and if it's not life-threatening and they can be moved out to the waiting room until such time as they can get them back, you can do that and put them in the triage area. Um, again, uh, this is going to be dependent on what you brought the patient in for. There are times where we will just have to sit and wait until they can get a bed available. Uh, assist the emergency department staff is required. So again, with us being a small rural community, um, there are times that we'll actually start the treatment on the cot while the nurse is dealing with other patients. Doctor will usually come in, look at them on the cot, start placing orders. We can help out by putting the orders in for the, the uh, nurses. So um, just be aware of what you can do to help your staff out. As soon as you're free from patient care activities, per the hospital report. So in Wyoming, by state regulation, there's actually a statute out there that tells us we have to have our reports done within two hours, unless situations arise that prevent us from doing that. So for the most part, we have to get started on those pre-hospital care reports as soon as possible. And it's important to do that because if that patient does get transferred, that report should be going with the patient to the next hospital. So they know what was done prior to arrival at the hospital that's sending the patient. That doesn't always happen, but as much as you can, try and, try and get that to happen. And as soon as you're free from, uh, okay, we just went over that. Uh, make sure you do leave the patient's personal effects with them. So if they brought a phone with them, and you're holding on to it, make sure you check your pockets before you leave. Make sure you leave anything you brought with them with them. Okay. And then the last thing I always do when I'm giving my report is, do you guys need anything else from me? Once I get that, then I'm released from there. Go ahead and put us back in service, and we go from there. Terminating call. Uh, quickly clean the patient compartment while taking appropriate standard precautions. 
make sure you're cleaning out your ambulance after every call. Uh, you don't know what these people have with them. So it's best to be on the safe side and just clean after every call. It's also a courtesy to your next patient to have a clean ambulance. So make sure you're cleaning your truck, make sure it's ready to go, um, make sure your oxygen's good. Um, it, like in our trucks, you have to turn the oxygen cylinders off in order to prevent them from leaking. Uh, make sure you're closing those systems down. Make sure you're saving your oxygen. Replace any expendable items, exchange equipment, according to your local policy. Um, make sure you're wiping down your blood pressure cuff, your lines, everything that you use during that call, make sure you're wiping it down. And then make up the cot. Yeah, I don't know if I would use a spray bottle to clean the inside of my ambulance floor, but I would get in there and mop it out, sweep it out, make sure it's clean. Okay. In route to quarters, make sure you're letting your dispatchers know you're back in service. JR quarters are at the hospital because we're hospital based. So as soon as we're done with the call, we'll call in, get our times from dispatch and let them know we're back in service. That way they can page and let the second crews know that they can go back to bed or um, return back to Glen Rock, depending on who's our secondary that day. And then if you do need to refuel, make sure you go and refuel your truck. Um, again, we're hospital-based, but if you work in a private uh, service, make sure you're putting any contaminated linens in the biohazard container, uh, non-contaminated go in a regular hamper. As necessary, clean any equipment that touches the patient. Again, we're going to do this at the hospital. Clean, disinfect, non-disposable respiratory assistant, assist and inhalation therapy equipment. So if you had to intubate the patient, make sure you clean your equipment properly. Clean sanitize the patient compartments. So you're going to do a little more deep clean once you get back to your quarters. And then prepare yourself for service. If you have to decompress for a little bit because it was a bad call, decompress. Do what you need to do. Talk it over with your, your partner, um, whatever you need to do to get yourself mentally prepared to go back into service. Place expendable items. Kind of already covered this. Make sure your oxygen is filled to the proper amount. Uh, if you, uh, like I said, our, ours, anything that drops below 500 is automatically re replaced. Um, place any patient care equipment, uh, carry out post-operation vehicle maintenance procedures as required. So at the end of your shift, make sure you do a walk around, make sure you didn't hit anything, make sure nothing's damaged. And then let the oncoming crew know if you found anything. And then make sure your paperwork is all complete. So we're almost done now. Air rescue. So there's a lot of times that we do call um, for air operations, either um, Wyoming Life Flight, Black Hills, Guardian. There's several of them around here that we use. Um, it helps speed up transport to a distant trauma center. So our nearest trauma center is 49.6 miles from our hospital. So if we know that we're going to be 30 miles out, basically anything over 15 miles out, and it needs to go to either a trauma center or a cardiac center, we're calling Life Flight and getting them on their way. Um, you can always turn them around. They are very adamant about that, that they would rather be called and turned around then be called and us have to wait on scene for 30 minutes for them to arrive. Um, during prior, if it's a high priority patient with prolonged uh, extrication, you might want to think about getting, getting air rescue on their way. And then anytime it's in a remote location. So we live in Wyoming. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to go 60 miles to get to our patient. Um, in one instance, it was a few years ago, we had a 
four wheeler wreck up on the mountain. It took us from the time of call to the time we got into the ER, nine hours. So we tried to get life flight to fly that day, but the weather was too bad. So we couldn't get life flight. Um, if life flight would have been able to respond, that patient would have been in an ER within four hours after getting the call. So that's what we're talking about as far as time reduction and time use. So make sure you're using your best judgment on this. And again, most of the flight companies, at least here in Wyoming, would rather be turned around than to not be called at all. So, so what are some clinical reasons <coughs> for uh, using flight? Um, patients in shock, Glasgow coma scale of uh, less than 10. Head injury with altered mental status, test, chest trauma, respiratory distress, penetrating injuries to the body cavity. It's all things that you might think about flight. And again, this is different from really, you know, large cities to rural units is because because we have such distances here in, in like Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Alaska, some of these places that are a little more remote, you might be an hour or two hours away from your nearest trauma center. So you want to think about getting flight there so that you can get these people to the proper care. Some other in, um, aspects of it. Um, amputation proximal to the foot or hand, extensive burns, serious mechanism of injury, and the patient is post cardiac arrest with a pulse. So, life flight, at least here in Wyoming, will not take someone on the bird if they don't have a pulse. And the reason being is you can't put a Lucas on a helicopter, there's just not enough room, and they don't have enough room to be doing CPR on a patient. So, the person does have to have a pulse before flight will take them. How to call for it, give them your name and a callback number. Let them know your name, nature of the situation, and the exact location, give them crossroads or lane, major landmarks, um, description of the landing zone, if possible, GPS coordinates. Usually either EMS or law enforcement will, will arrive on scene. Our sheriff's deputies are pretty good about that. They will have... Um, a landing zone set up, picked out prior to us getting on scene and prior to a flight getting on scene. Now, that doesn't always necessarily mean the pilot's gonna choose that location because they're gonna do a fly around and make sure that that is the best location for them to land. And, uh, you know, don't be butthurt if the pilot doesn't take your landing zone. So they may see something in the air that you don't see. Um, make sure you're looking at your terrain, uh, major landmarks such as towers, cell towers, um, highways, uh, nearest town, stuff like that. You can give them uh, where you're at, what road to follow up. They're usually pretty good about finding you. Um, we do carry on our trucks, at least I do, um, smoke um, that we can pop. If we can see the helicopter and they're having a hard time finding us, during daylight operations, we can pop smoke, tell them the direction uh, we're at from where they're at, and they can usually see that. That also gives them an indication of wind, direction, and speed, too. And also be per uh, aware of wires and ditches and stuff like that that might make it a hazard for us getting the patient either to the helicopter or... Um, for them to land at. Sorry about that, mine slipped. All right, so landing zone should be at least 100 foot by 100 foot. Should be clear debris and not have any power lines or trees or buildings near it. Um, also be aware of fence lines. So we have had incidents where um, we cleared an area but the grass was tall enough that when the helicopter landed, they didn't see a T-post and it poked up through the bottom of the, of the helicopter. 
So be aware of where fence lines are and where fence lines might have been. So make sure you walk the area before the helicopter gets there so that you can make sure there's no debris, no rocks, no fence posts or anything like that. That might be a hazard to the helicopter. All right. So approach the helicopter. Um, most of the time, if we're doing a hot load, we're going to be approaching from the left side of the helicopter in this way. Um, what that does is it gives us the safest approach. That's usually the side we're going to be loading on on the helicopters they use out here. Pilots usually always on the right front. Um, very rarely will you approach from the front of the helicopter, mostly because of the fact that uh, blades tend to dip down in the front. Uh, those are danger areas. You will never, ever go around the back of the helicopter. You will stay away from basically the, the front or the back of the engine compartment forward. You will stay in that area. Um, Believe me, you do not want to approach from the back because they will start yelling at you. Um, anytime you approach, you only approach when the flight personnel tell you to. Uh, the crew of the helicopter will direct loading of the patient. And again, you will stay clear of the rotor at tail rotor at all times. Uh, you also want to keep traffic back at least 100 feet from the helicopter. Um, for a couple of reasons, one, it's a danger to the helicopter because if they have to, especially if you got big patient in there and a big crew, they're going to need some distance to kind of take off. And also when they do take off, they are going to throw rocks and dust and gravel up at you and it could damage your, your vehicle. Make sure you're not smoking near the aircraft again. They're probably not going to let you that close to a helicopter to smoke unless everything's shut down, but you're not gonna smoke around it. And be aware of the danger areas, front and tail of the helicopter, just make sure you're aware of it. And before the helicopter lands, understand they build up a lot of static electricity. So it's kind of good that if you have a gas spill or something with fumes around it, to make sure the landing zone's far enough away that that static's not gonna ignite, ignite something. All right, so chapter review, inspecting the vehicle to ensure it is complete and critical items can be easily located. Hot response means using lights and sirens. Hot response involves high risk. Cold response means no lights and sirens and it decreases the risk. Always follow your state laws um, dealing with emergency vehicle driving. Um, at least for our course here, those all are included on the flash drive that I gave you at the beginning of the class. Um, however, it must be done with due regard for the safety of others. Pay attention, do not text, make phone calls, drink beverages, and or be in any way distracted while driving. Um, especially do not be texting on your phone. So many of our wrecks in Wyoming are due to distracted driving from texting or phone calls. And if you do have a CAD system, the driver should never be on the CAD. That is the passenger's job. Um, that's your partner's job to give you directions off the CAD system. You should never be on the CAD. Make sure all your gear is secured because um, it will become a projectile during a crash. Do not let your patients uh, become a projectile. Make sure you're using the shoulder straps. Wear your seatbelt in front and back whenever possible. Um, also, all our trucks have airbags. Don't put your feet up on the dash. I see that in a couple of TikTok videos that one of our medics posts. Don't do it. Um, know the medical and operational reasons for helicopter transport and know how to set up a safe landing zone. Okay. This is all stuff that um, you guys have with you. Just remember, properly stocked, prepare the ambulance, 
Make sure your pre-call inspections are done. Um, remember, uh, the, thank your dispatchers once in a while because they have a tough job. Uh, that's probably the toughest job in emergency services. I appreciate my dispatchers all the time. Uh, each stat, uh, state has statutes regarding operation of emergency vehicles. Be familiar with what your local protocols say. Um, EMT should use good judgment due regard for the safety of others while operating a, an ambulance. Okay. Yeah, definitely make sure your patient is secure before the ambulance starts moving. And make sure you're doing continuation of care. Also, one of the things we didn't really go over is uh, railroad tracks, bumps, cattle guards, anything that might bump your, your patients around corners. Um, all this stuff are things you need to think about your, the safety of your, your patient and people that are in the back. You're approaching railroad tracks, slow down. Uh, cattle guards, same thing. You don't take curves at high speeds. Uh, if you can warn your people in the back that something's coming up, give them a warning. Remember, diesels are loud, so if you yell back at them, they may not hear you, so try to slow down the best you can. When you're doing transfer of care, make sure that that transfer of care is done properly so that uh, you don't get charged with abandonment. If, uh, make sure you're giving a good report. Make sure you clean your ambulance and restocking it after every call. And then uh, be sure, you know, if you think you need a um, flight, call them. Like I said, you can always turn them around. All right. If you have any questions, be sure to bring them to the next class. Uh, we'll be covering hazmat and uh, response to terrorism on Monday. Test will be on Wednesday. Thank you.